It is the best-selling book in history. No volume ever written has been more loved and quoted. And its words, sometimes simple and sometimes mysterious, should always be studied carefully. It is the Bible, the Word of God. Welcome to Bible Answers Live, providing accurate and practical answers to all your Bible questions. This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. To receive any of the Bible resources mentioned in this broadcast, call 800-835-6747. Once again, that's 800-835-6747. Now, here's your host from Amazing Facts International, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Hello, friends. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? One of the most ingenious and daring escapes ever achieved took place in 1979. Two families, with eight members in total, escaped the oppressive country of communist East Germany by crossing the border to West Germany in a homemade hot air balloon. After two previous failed attempts and near capture, the determined Strelzik and Witzel families tried again. On September 16, the four adults and four children wedged into a 15 square foot steel and rope basket. Using a homemade flamethrower, they filled a balloon that they had secretly made on a sewing machine with about 1,435 square yards of different colored fabric. At two in the morning, with a glowing balloon towering 100 feet above them, the gondola rose above East Germany and it drifted for 11 miles in 30 minutes, carrying the family over the Iron Curtain to freedom, where they safely touched down in West Germany's Bavaria. You know, the Bible tells of another eight people that floated to freedom. Stay with us and we're going to learn more on this edition of Bible Answers Live. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, accurate and practical answers to your Bible questions. Hi, listening friends. Welcome to Bible Answers Live. And if you've got any Bible questions, it's a free phone call. That number is 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800 800- Four six three seven two nine seven. We are also streaming the program, and soon we're going to be on uh, some network stations. We're just these are pilot programs that we're we've just recently moved into our new studio. If you want to see what it looks like, you can go to the Doug Bachelor Facebook page or the Amazing Facts Facebook page, and you'll see uh, the studio as it unfolds and comes together. My name is Doug Batchelor. My name is John Ross. Good evening, friends, and Pastor Doug, as we always do, let's start the program with prayer. Dear Father, we thank you that we have this opportunity to open up your word and study together. And Father, we recognize the Bible is your book. And in order for us to correctly understand it, we need the Holy Spirit. So we ask for the Holy Spirit to be with us here in the studio and be with those who are listening wherever they might be, in their car or at home. We just pray for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Doug, you opened the program talking about an amazing escape. It's always exciting to read about the commitment and the hard work of uh, people wanting freedom. And uh, finally, families working together understand there were situations where um, they were sort of on the radar screen of the authorities. They began to suspect something, and so they had to uh, sew this uh, hot air balloon in secret, and they were able to bring fabric together. It was just an incredible feat. But it worked for them. They actually floated over to uh, West Germany. Yeah, and just the, the commitment and the, the danger, not only the danger of possibly being caught and imprisoned, but the danger of dying. Mm-hmm. I mean, at one point, their balloon caught on fire when they were igniting it, and they had to calmly put it out with a fire extinguisher. So, uh, yeah, it's just an amazing story, and it's obvious that they had some divine help in getting across mm-hmm. the border. But when I thought about those eight people floating to freedom, it made me think about a time in the Bible. You can read in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. <laughs> they didn't float up on the air. They floated up on the water. You can read in Genesis 7, 17. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark. And it rose high above the earth until ultimately those waters covered the highest mountains. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, Jesus is giving some prophecies about the second coming. And he says in Matthew chapter 24, thank you, you can read in verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, 
so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Talks about how the world had become so preoccupied with just selfish pursuits and earthly pursuits. Nobody was thinking about God that uh, the, the flood kind of took them all by surprise. And Jesus said, it's going to be that way again, just before the second coming. And we're seeing that in the world today. Not only did Jesus say it would be like the days of Noah in Luke chapter 17, he says it's also going to be like the days of Lot and the, you know, the immorality and the perversion and uh, that you see back in the story of Lot is going to be replicated in the last days. And, and I think we're seeing that prophecy fulfilled right now. So um, how do you get ready for, <laughs> the Bible says the world will not be destroyed next time with a flood, but it's going to be a fire. Mm -hmm. How do you survive that? We've got a free offer that talks about how to be rescued from that calamity. Our study guide is entitled Rescue From Above, and we'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks. It's a free phone call. The number to call is 800-835-6747, and you can ask for our Amazing Facts study guide. It's entitled Rescue From Above. We'll send it to you for free. If you're outside of North America, we encourage you to take a look at our website, just amazingfacts.org, and you'll be able to read the study guide right there. Again, it's called Rescue From Above. Well, we're ready to go to the phone lines. We've got our first caller this evening. We've got uh, George listening from New, New Jersey or North Jersey. George, welcome to the program. Yes, North Jersey, where we've had a lot of snow lately, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thanks for calling. Yes, good evening, pastors. Yeah, I was looking at uh, Isaiah, uh, reading some of Isaiah chapter 2. The first four verses of that chapter talks about uh, something to pass in the latter days. And uh, it, it kind of seems like it's talking about the new earth, but then it says latter days. So I wonder how you would interpret that. I know uh, some premillennialists who believe that the reign of Christ is on the earth would interpret that as the millennial age, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know you don't teach that or believe that. And Isaiah has a lot of, uh, I've asked some questions before uh, for, to you about Isaiah, and has some Passages seem very difficult at times, you know, as to when they take place. Right. So if you can enlighten me on that, on those first four verses of second chapter of uh, Isaiah. Okay, well, for our friends listening, George, I'm going to read a few of those verses. We always know that uh, a lot of our folks are kind of working or cooking in the kitchen. And when I left home, Karen was cooking up a storm. And uh, sometimes they're driving down the road. So we want to just read this. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem now it will come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Well, let's just pause right there for a minute. Now, Isaiah, I think, is giving what you would call a dual prophecy here. Uh, first of all, um, during the time of Christ, with the ministry of Christ, the message of truth was not just for the Jews. It was for all nations. And so this is a prophecy that when it talks about all nations flowing to the house of the Lord, when Jesus walked out of the temple and he said, your house has left you desolate, and the earthly sanctuary was ultimately destroyed, um, Christ had destroyed his temple made with hands. I will make one without hands. And he spoke of his body, the church. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Christ began to build up another spiritual house. Peter said, we are living stones in that house. Ephesians chapter two says, we are being built up in, into a house, a dwelling place for God. And so this was in part a prophecy that now the gospel, the pure gospel about Jesus would be exalted where all nations could see it and they would flow to it. So there's a, there's a spiritual analogy there. But quite literally, at the end of the millennium, when God uh, brings the new Jerusalem down to earth and uh, all the wicked are destroyed, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth, the Bible says, and Isaiah says that actually, and uh, all people will flow unto God. And it tells us that the Lord God is the temple in it. And so uh, uh, I, I think this prophecy will literally be fulfilled when the kingdom of God fills the earth and uh, 
people from every tribe and nation that are have accepted Christ will flow to the Lord. Any thoughts on that? Yes, some of these prophecies seem to be spiritual, then literal, right? They seem to be a combined thing sometimes. Yeah, there's several places you'll find what they call a dual prophecy. Let me give you a quick example, because uh, this comes up sometimes. In Matthew 24, the disciples come to Jesus and they said, uh, when will this be, the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple and the second coming? And he combines his whole answer into one soliloquy he gives there in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. Part of it's talking about when the temple would be destroyed by the Romans, but it's a dual prophecy that talks about a final assault on God's people before the second coming. So um, you've got several examples of these dual prophecies in the Bible. Well, I hope that helps a little bit, George. Appreciate your calling in and uh, probably ought to head to another caller. Okay, we've got Amanda listening from Texas. Amanda, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you. Thank you for calling. Yes. Um, well, my question is about the description of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, verse 14 through 15. Um, but the description of him in the Bible is totally different from the portrait that people have of him. Wouldn't that be deceiving everybody? Well, what description in the Bible? You mean this one? Um, it's in Revelation. Right. Yeah, this is a description of Christ in heaven. I don't think it's telling us exactly what Jesus looked like on earth. Um, where does the prophecy, Pastor Ross, in Daniel, where it also says, uh, I saw, he's, uh, it kind of describes the Lord, and um, I think maybe Daniel 7 is another description of Jesus, or God anyway. And, and it describes God in this glorified state. But... Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's telling us, you know, he was six feet tall and he had brown eyes or blue eyes or anything like that. I think the verse you're referring to is Daniel chapter 10, verse 6. Again, a very similar description that you find in Revelation oh, 1, okay, 14. Yeah. talks about eyes as flames of fire and, and feet like burial or, or brass mm -hmm. uh, in the fire. Uh, of course, this is a symbolic representation of Jesus. Here you've got a picture of uh, a sword coming out of his mouth, the sharp two-edged sword. Well... That, of course, is symbolic. Revelation is a symbolic book. So I don't think you can take the description that you find in Revelation chapter 1 and say, well, that's, that's exactly what Jesus looks like now in heaven. There's a lot of symbolism mm -hmm. in the book of Revelation. Yeah, so Amanda, when it talks about the sword coming out of Jesus' mouth, uh, you probably will understand that's a symbol because the Bible says the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. So we know that Jesus has the word in his mouth. His eyes are like a flame of fire because he sees and knows all things. Uh, it says his hair is like pure wool because it says our sins will be whiter than wool. He's pure. And so I, I think there's a lot of analogies in the description, but he will be visible and he will be a glorious being when we see him in the second coming. You know, one of the big mysteries, there's only one very dubious description, physical description of Jesus in history. And it's probably, it's what they call an apocryphal writing, meaning that, you know, mm -hmm. somebody probably manufactured it, but it's supposed to be the description of a Roman soldier that he gave of Jesus. But it's, it's, and that's where I think a lot of artists get this conception of he's got, you know, hazel air, hair and, and brown eyes and he's, uh, you know, six feet tall or medium build. And yeah, I, I don't think we can count on that. So would it be wrong to even have that portrait? Because like, that's what a lot of people go to is that portrait. Yeah, you know, it's there's a risk. As I travel around the world, and I'm sure this is true with Pastor Ross, when I go to India, it's very interesting. They have a very Indian picture of Jesus, and you'll see it in the artwork there, the Indian Christians. Mm -hmm. And when I go to Africa, I see a more African uh, picture of Jesus. And when I go mm -hmm. to the Pacific Islands, I see a more Polynesian description of Jesus. So everyone sort of, you know, superimposes some of their ideas on what they think Jesus looks like. But we've got to be careful with those pictures because the Bible warns us against idolatry, which could be a statue. It could be a picture. Yeah. Yeah. And Deuteronomy, right? Yeah. Well, in uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy and even Revelation, guard against idols and images. Yeah. Okay. So, well, I hope that helps a little bit. Hey, we thank you very much, Amanda. And um, yeah, we've got to keep in mind that God is more glorious than anything we can imagine. You're listening to Bible Answers Live. This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. 
If you'd like answers to your Bible-related questions on the air, please call us next Sunday between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Call us at 1-800-GOD-SAYS. Did you know Amazing Facts has a free Bible school that you can do from the comfort of your own home? It includes 27 beautifully illustrated study lessons to aid in your study of God's Word. Sign up today for this free Bible study course by calling 1-844-215-7000. That's 1-844-215-7000. All right, we've got Noah listening in Illinois. Noah, welcome to Bible Answers Live. Thanks for having me, Doug and uh, Jean. My question is, how come you never really see any wedding ceremonies in the Old Testament? For example, when Jacob married Rebecca or uh, ah! Isaac got married. Yeah, well, you you do see a wedding ceremony, and not so much the ceremony, but you know, there. Yeah, I guess it's a wedding ceremony with Jacob and uh, Leah. Talks about the days of the wedding feast, and uh, you don't see one with Isaac. Isaac's a very unusual account, where it tells us that basically Abraham contracted for a wife. He sent the dowry, Eliezer picked up a Rebecca from uh, the land of Haran, brought her back. Isaac knew his wife was in route. <laughs> and when he met her, says he took her to his mother's tent. Of course, at that point, his father is like 140 years old because uh, Isaac was 40 when he got married. So Abraham's got to be 140 mm -hmm. years old. So he didn't have a big celebration, I don't know. That says he took her to his mother's tent and she became his wife. But with Jacob, there is a wedding ceremony. And then you get to the book Judges. It talks about the wedding ceremony of Samson. And there's some others. But um, get some very interesting wedding ceremonies. After the Benjamites were destroyed, where the girls went out dancing and the men captured their wives. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's, that's pretty primitive. But um, I don't know if we're answering your question, Noah. You, you, you answered it. I just wanted to know, like, how, like, I didn't think that there was wedding ceremonies in the Old Testament. Well, we in uh, Pastor Ross might find it, but it talks about a, a seven-day wedding feast for Jacob when he married Leah. He was supposed to marry Rachel, but his father pulled a switchy Rooney on him at the last minute, and he ended up marrying Leah. And then he had to he had to end up marrying Rachel too. And then he got their handmaids. He got four for the price of one, you might say. You're looking it up. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's in Genesis. Uh, yeah, Genesis chapter 29 talks about the the wedding and uh, how that, yeah, Jacob was deceived. He was expecting <laughs> the other sister. I've got to talk to him about that when we get Rachel. to heaven. <laughs> I'll, I'll take him off by himself and have a little chat and say, how is it you did not know that was Leah until the morning? <laughs> All right. All right, we've got uh, Jordan listening in Tennessee. Jordan, welcome to the program. Hi. Hey, thanks for calling and your question. Um, I was reading in Matthew uh, chapter 13, verses 3 through 9 about the seeds. I don't understand the parable that he's talking about. Matthew 13, and uh, this is, it starts when he said, um, a sower went out to sow. Yes. And he sowed some seeds. Is there a, a part of it you do not understand? Because Jesus actually explains it a little later in, in the same chapter. Yes, I know, but I um, have mild CP and from four years duration, and I'm really slow at learning things. Okay. And uh, I have a uh, King James Bible, and it's kind of really hard to read to me. Well, let me see if I can help you a little bit. Uh, here Jesus tells about a man who's sowing seeds, and the seeds, when they threw seeds out in Bible time, they would do what they called broadcast, and they quite literally would reach into a bag of seeds, they'd walk through the field, and they cast their arm in a big sweeping motion. Karen and I did this last week with poppy seeds out behind our office. And uh, you just the primitive way of broadcasting. Well, some of the seeds, you can't control where every seed lands. Some seeds fell on good soil. Some seeds fell on rocky ground. Some seeds fell on the uh, shallow ground. And some seeds fell on the path. And he said that, you know, the birds came and got the seeds that fell on the path. The seeds that fell on the shallow ground that was uh, full of rocks it um, it sprang up, but because it didn't have any depth, as soon as it got warm, it, it died out. Some of the seeds fell among the weeds and the thorns choked so they didn't, they had to compete with the vegetation and they kind of died off. And then some seeds fell in good soil and they were very productive. And then Christ explains that the seeds that are snatched away by the ravens or the birds, that means when someone hears the word of God, the seed is the word of God. Someone first hears the word of God, 
sometimes the devil will snatch it away and distract them and keep them from really even paying attention to it. And when the seeds fall among the, the thorns, the cares of this life choke it out. They get too worried about, well, you know, how am I going to serve God? And they, they worry so much about uh, making money and their job and the other uh, personal needs of life. And then when it says some seed has shallow ground, it doesn't put down roots. Uh, they don't nurture it. And uh, when they hear the word of God, they, they don't read, they don't pray, and it just doesn't really even take root. So this is the way that different people respond when they hear the Bible preached. And um, hopefully that helps a little bit, Jordan. And we appreciate your calling in with your question tonight. All right, we've got Jerry listening in Oregon. Jerry, welcome to the program. Uh, good evening, pastors. Basically, I have a lifelong friend who has been a good person, but he's never made a Christian commitment. He was diagnosed with uh, bone cancer recently, and he's going to go into hosp hospice shortly. And he's finally verbally, to me, acknowledged the Lord. And uh, he lives 300 miles away, no church affiliation. I'll be visiting him. But I don't know what to do about the baptism issue. Again, bone cancer, as you know, can be extremely painful. Mm -hmm. Usually they're highly sedated. No, I understand my mother died from bone cancer. Um, well, you know, if you have a chance to visit with him and he's still lucid, uh, it's wonderful that he has uh, opened his mind to God. Don't be afraid to ask him, uh, just in the simplest terms, uh, does he believe that God, first of all, he knows he's sinned. Does he believe the promise of God that God sent Jesus in the world to suffer for the sins of the world? And that would include the sins of your friend. And if he acknowledges that he believes that, um, then say, have you asked God to forgive your sins for Christ's sake? Will you accept that Jesus died for your sins? And be optimistic that he'll say yes. And then say, well, let's ask him right now. I'm sure he will. Yeah, and pray with him and just say, you might even ask him, say, you know, can you repeat after me? Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent. I accept Jesus' sacrifice in my behalf. And just, you know, you'll even find online some very simple uh, outlines of biblically, how do you lead a person to Christ? And it's a very simple, um, it's a, a choice that you can make and you can help him with that choice. You don't have to be a pastor. He doesn't have to be baptized. If, if he can't be baptized, you can tell him Jesus will give him credit for his baptism. Christ was baptized. He never sinned. He can get credit for Jesus' baptism. So don't let that be an obstacle to his having peace in his final hours that God will forgive his sins. Well, okay, then uh, I'm, without sounding haughty, I've got a fair biblical knowledge, and I'm a Christian, uh, but if he expresses desire, would I, should I do this, And for example, in a bathtub, if he feels he can physically do manage? If, if, if the hospital or his circumstances will accommodate that, I actually, I went to one lady who was felt very strongly she wanted to be baptized. She was also dying from a lung cancer in this case. And she said, can we use my bathtub? I said, absolutely. And she at that point had, um, she'd kind of wasted away where she was only about 90 pounds and her son lifted her up, and put her in the bathtub and I baptized her. And uh, she just came out just smiling and, and uh, felt great peace at that. So you can do that. Um, I don't think baptism will be an obstacle to their salvation if they're, you know, on their deathbed. Um, you know, some people. Well, but if it'll give him peace and you can do it, then by all means. Maybe I shouldn't use the word deathbed, but he's, he's been told basically he has between three weeks and three months. And as you know, he's going to be most likely be in morphine or fentanyl or one of those. Yeah, it could be on a lot of pain. Well, you know, even even when you're under the influence, uh, I've talked to people who are on morphine and they can still understand. Uh, so I'll pray that God gives you wisdom, Jerry. That's wonderful. You're going to go see your friend and, and uh, maybe in his closing earthly days, you can be a source of great encouragement and peace mm -hmm. for him. And we, we pray that's the case. All right, thank you for your call, Jerry. We've got uh, Faith listening in Texas. Faith, welcome to the program. Hi. Hey, you got a great name. Hi, Faith. Hi. Uh, my question is, um, what's the difference between murder and kill? 
Okay, good question. Now, if you if you have a mosquito biting you on the arm and you slap him, you will not be arrested by the police for murder. Murder is a crime where you take away an innocent human life. Um, if a, a soldier goes to war and he's ordered to defend his country, and sometimes in doing that, he has to shoot the enemy, uh, that soldier will never be accused of murder. Um, and if a policeman is protecting people who are being robbed and he has to shoot someone and they die, it is killing, but it's not murder. Now, the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt do no murder. I know it says in, the, uh, in King James it's translated, thou shalt not kill, but technically it actually says, thou shalt do mo no murder. And when Jesus quotes that commandment in the New Testament, he does say it that way. He says, you shall not murder. You know, we're not to take innocent human life. And so uh, that's the difference, you know. Um, you know, every time you pull a weed, you're killing something, technically. Yeah. Yeah. Does that help at all? Yes. Okay, you're not thinking about murdering anyone, are you? Uh, no. Okay, good. Just making sure. All right. Hey, well, we're really thankful you called in, Faith. Appreciate that. You have a good night. And by the way, you're about 10 years old. We have uh, a special series of study guides Pastor Ross and I did, both video and lessons, called Amazing Adventure. You can just type in Amazing Adventure in Google and it will take you to the Amazing Facts uh, Bible Study Series. And we think you'd really enjoy that faith if you've not already seen it. Thank you for your call. We've got our uh, next caller from New Jersey, Hava. Well, Hava, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a conflict over the passage, the heavens belong to God and the earth is given to man. And uh, the conflict seems to be growing greater with all the explorations into space. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, what verse are you talking about? Because I don't know that passage in the Bible. Oh, it is. In, it's in the Old Testament. Do you know where? Yes, I do. It's a very well-known verse. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I, I haven't heard that verse before. I mean, it does say that, you know, God made the heavens and the earth in Genesis, but I don't remember the part where it says that, uh, you know, the heavens belong to God, but the earth belongs to man. It does say that God gave Adam dominion over the earth. So I was just wanting to make sure before I answered uh, exactly what verse she was referring to. Sometimes people hear part of a verse and part of a, a saying from culture and they think it's in the Bible, but um, it's not. <laughs> Friends, that's why we're here. We're going to try and answer more Bible questions in just a minute. Don't go anywhere. We're coming back. You can still call in with your questions. 800-GOD-SAYS, and we're back. Stay tuned. Bible Answers Live will return shortly. Written by the hand of God and spoken with His voice. Some words will never fade. Get Pastor Doug Batchelor's 12-part sermon series on the Ten Commandments by calling 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. Millions of people believe that planet Earth is on the verge of some apocalypse that will plunge the world's cities into chaos. In response, thinking people everywhere are wondering if it might be a good time to locate their families outside of the congested metropolitan areas. In my new book, Heading for the Hills, A Beginner's Guide to Country Living, I do my best to provide a biblical balance. I'd like to share with you some of the crucial things you'll need to know before you head up for the hills. I'd also like to identify some of the practical things you look for in buying a piece of country land, how to develop water, power, and a garden, all while still seeking to save the lost. This book has some very valuable information for anybody that's ever considering country living. Order your copy of Heading for the Hills. Call 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, where every question answered provides a clearer picture of God and His plan to save you. So what are you waiting for? 
Get practical answers about the good book for a better life today. This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. If you'd like answers to your Bible-related questions on the air, please call us next Sunday between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Pacific Time. To receive any of the Bible resources mentioned in this evening's program, call 800-835-6747. Once again, that's 800-835-6747. Now, let's rejoin our hosts for more Bible Answers Live. We are back listening, friends. Thank you for staying with us. And if you have a Bible question, the number to call in with your question is 800-463-7297. And uh, that's 800 God Says. We are streaming on Facebook. You can watch the program right now and listen by going to the Amazing Facts Facebook page or the Doug Batchelor Facebook page. And I am Doug Batchelor. My name is Jean Ross, and we've got some colas lined up, Pastor Doug. So we go to the next one. We have Martin listening from Michigan. Martin, welcome to the program. Thank you. I have a Bible verse that I want to understand better. It's 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, thus written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. When I read this Bible verse, pastors, I started writing the letter to God. And I have about 10 pages so far. So you want me to, to share with you what we think that verse means? I, I, The way I understood it, it was like telling me to write a letter to God. But then is that the same as just praying? Well, let's talk about that for just a second. Uh, when Paul says um, in Romans, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he said, uh, I'll start with verse 2. You are our epistle. Now, the word epistle means letter, and I think you know that written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Paul is saying to the church members, you know, uh, the change in your life is seen by all men. You are the epistle that we wrote through the words that we speak. They've been written in your heart and now people see the change in your life. And then he says in verse three, clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but on the tablets of flesh that is on the heart. You can read where it says in Ecclesiastes and in Jeremiah and in Hebrews chapter 8 that the new covenant is written. He says, I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And the new covenant is written on our hearts. And the word of God is written on our hearts and that changes our lives. Our lives are now guided by the word and not by uh, a letter written in stone. And so I think that's what um, Paul is emphasizing here. You want to add anything to that yeah not that it's wrong to to write down your thoughts um maybe even write down a prayer you have the psalms many of which are prayers that were written down but god doesn't need us to write down our prayers we can pray and god can hear and he will answer but sometimes it is helpful to kind of organize our thoughts and, and write them down but i think this verse pastor as you mentioned this is a, a living letter where we're example of christ's grace to those around us they can see our lives have been changed and it's a testimony or a witness. And I think that is the primary reference here that Paul is making. Yep, very good. Hey, thank you, Martin. Appreciate that call. We've got David listening in New York. David, welcome to the program. Hi, how you doing? Um, I'm puzzled by uh, Romans 10.4, where it says Christ is the end of the law. What does exactly does that mean? Yeah, now when you say law in the Jewish mind, there were several categories of law. Uh, There were a number of ceremonial laws that started when God called the Hebrew nation. And for instance, the law about circumcision, sacrificing lambs in the temple, uh, the priesthood. The Bible tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, that the veil in the temple was ripped from top to bottom because now it's not a physical temple. It's uh, the church. God's people are a living temple. And it tells us the high priest rent his robes and it's not the earthly Levitical high priest uh, anymore. Now the Bible says we're a nation of kings and priests. And so uh, all the ceremonial laws have been done away with. The laws about keeping the annual Sabbaths and the feast days and the things that had to do with the sanctuary. Christ is our Passover lamb. 
it's not saying the Ten Commandments are done away with because that's a law that God spoke with his voice. He wrote with his own finger. He wrote it in stone. It's a very different nature. Clearly, it is still wrong to murder, to lie, to commit adultery, to use God's name in vain, so forth. And so uh, it's talking about Jesus was the fulfillment of all these ceremonial laws that were shadows that pointed to him. You know, also, if you look at the verse just ahead, verse 3, it talks about a group of people who were trying to obtain righteousness by their works. It says, in seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Then it says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So here it's talking about how do we obtain the righteousness that is needed for entry into heaven. It's not the result of works. It comes by faith in Jesus. And then I think he goes on to explain that even further. And that faith in Christ should be manifest in the way a person lives. Our life should reflect the fact that we are committed to Christ. And so that's not taken away from holy living. Rather, it's telling us how one ought to live by receiving Christ. Right. And Paul has this debate uh, often in Galatians, and the big debate there in Galatians was over circumcision in particular. Mm -hmm. He's saying, you know, that's not the, that's not the uh, avenue to righteousness. Thank you very much, David. Hope that helps. We've got Paul listening in Indiana. Paul, welcome to the program. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. All right. I have a question about judgment, specifically on Matthew nineteen twenty-eight. The you know, in the, the Old Testament and, and throughout the Bible, it talks about God judging and or God judging through Jesus, um, you know, Deuteronomy, Ezekiel, Romans, Acts. But in Matthew and, and in Revelation 20, verse 4, it talks about judgment given over to the saints or to some others that sit on the throne. So I just wondered, you know, what, what you thought about that. Yeah, and keep in mind, uh, judging in the Bible did not always mean the way we think of a judge where they sit down and you've got them, they're, they got their wooden gavel and they're going innocent, guilty, I find you guilty, guilty, innocent. Uh, there were judges in Bible times that would, they were supposed to exalt God and you've got the uh, roughly 12 judges if you include Samuel, I think, you know, Samson was a judge and talks about uh, Deborah and Barak and these different uh, judges, um, they were leaders. And so when it talks about the 12 apostles sitting on 12 thrones judging, they were not like different circuit courts that were, you know, dealing with DMV speeding tickets. And so some of the judgment you read about in Revelation chapter 20 is talking about a judgment where the redeemed are evaluating the judgments of God. Uh, and they may even be, you know, affirming that God is righteous in uh, not giving those fallen angels another chance <laughs> that they're going to go to the lake of fire. But um, I think here where he's talking about the 12 apostles, you'll be judging the 12. He's saying through eternity, they're going to be in thrones. They're going to be in positions of glorifying God and leadership. Uh, but it won't be judgment the way we think of it here on earth. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. We've got Brian listening in Michigan. Brian, you're on Bible Answers Live. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. Yeah. Thanks for calling. Um, I've got a question here. I, I've always been close with God all my life, but <laughs> I got a little, say, arrogant about it. And over the, I just realized all of a sudden, about two or three months ago, I saw my sins through somebody else's eyes and realized I've been spending the last 20 years pretty much living in sin. So I straightened my life out. I cut out all media. I just really got down to just focusing on Christ, listening to sermons instead of watching movies. And one of the sermons that's popped up, one of the things popped up three or four times is Doug Batcher's sermon where he says that grieving the Holy Spirit. And then he says, there's some in the Bible that didn't even know they lost it. So now all of a sudden I'm in fear because there's nothing more scary to me than separation from God. How do I know if I grieve the Holy Spirit away from myself or not? Well, based on what you're telling me, uh, you've got conviction of sin. I think people, when they've <laughs> grieved away the Holy Spirit, they don't even have that gift of conviction. The other thing is you're, you're making reforms. It sounds like the Spirit's working in your life to turn away from what is evil and, and to draw near to God. And that's, that's the Holy Spirit that draws you. So, you know, I'm, I'm not your judge, but I would, uh, I would guess from the fruit of what you're telling me that you still have an interest in God and uh, one thing you said did kind of trigger a concern for me. You said, I'm straightening myself out. Now, I think I know what you mean by that. You know, you're, you're trying to make practical changes in your life. But ultimately, uh, you, you, we really need to trust God to uh, transform us. 
that's one thing that went through my mind is, you know, would I even be able to do this on my own anyways? And that just came into my head before I called you. I go, well, wait a minute. If I'm making these changes, am I making them? Or, you know, can I even do that on my own? Or is the Holy Spirit doing this? And that's what I can look at. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds like the Spirit of God's working in your mind right now. I mean, I, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, I, well, I mean, you know, I shouldn't say you should never worry about grieving away the Holy Spirit, but I don't think that that's something you've done based on what you're sharing. I uh, thank you for that. I, that's, I just, you know, um, it's a hard life and there's so much distractions out there. It is getting tougher. But when I was 40 years old, I'm 58. When I was 40, I, I was a Sabbath keeper since I was six, raised in a Sunday church. And then when I turned 40, I realized I just wasted my life. I've been doing sports, athletics, all stuff, no girlfriend for like 20 years. And all of a sudden I got on my knees. I prayed and God answered my prayer with a wife on the other side of the world from the Philippines. And yeah, she's been working on my life too. And um, that's how I got found you. And I am thankful for you to be there because you have taught me a lot. I got to thank you for that before I let you go. Well, that's okay. I sure appreciate that. Thanks so much, Brian. And we do have a book talks about uh, the Holy Spirit. That's and right. To, and grieving away the Holy Spirit, what that means. We've got the book that it's entitled. I'm thinking we have several, Pastor Doug. We have one that's called Life in the Spirit that talks about uh, the power of the Holy Spirit transforming somebody's life. And we'll be happy to send that to anyone who calls and asks. Uh, the number to call for that is 800-835-6747. And you can ask for the book called Life in the Spirit. We'll be happy to send it to you. We also have a book talking about the unpardonable sin. I think it's called um, Point of No Return. Yes, it's actually an encouraging book, but it says what is and what is not grieving away the Holy Spirit. And we'll also be happy to send that to anyone who calls and asks. We've got Rachel listening in Arizona. Rachel, welcome to the program. Hi, good evening. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is concerning Revelation 18.23. Um, do you want to read it first? or? Sure. It says, And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by them thy sorceries, by uh, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Right, and so, um, so the question is concerning um, the word pharma pharmakia. Pharmakia, yeah, that's sorceries. That's where we get the word pharmacy. <laughs> yes. So the question is, could Revelation 18, um, chapter 18, be referring to how the world will attempt to solve the plagues in the last days through pharmaceuticals? You know, I've not thought of that. Uh, I, I have, I have thought because uh, sorcerers used to use drugs, and I have thought we are living in a time where there's a lot of drug abuse, mm -hmm. and um, that you know the devil has he snared so many people with addictions to alcohol and opi opioids and uh, heroin and you name it, you know, crack and meth and um, yeah, there's a lot of people have been deceived by drugs. I was in that generation where we were all taking hallucinogenics. To, I, I don't hesitate telling people this because they think I'm still having a flashback when I preach. But uh, I was in that generation where we were taking mushrooms and hallucinogenics trying to find God and it was a big deception. All you found is really confusion. But uh, that's ph pharmacia, you know, the <laughs> the sorceries. Mm -hmm. And I think in the, in the context here, it's talking about the fall of Babylon. We know that there are uh, a number of false uh, Christs in the last days. There will be false miracles, and uh, that will actually be used by the devil to gather and galvanize support for uh, his false claims at the end of time. So there's also a reference to that here in, in this passage in Revelation 18. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. You're listening to Bible Answers Live. This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. If you'd like answers to your Bible-related questions on the air, please call us next Sunday between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Call us at 1-800-GOD-SAYS. Next caller that we have is uh, Isaac from uh, Arizona. Isaac, welcome to the program. Oh, hello. Hi. How do you know if you're written the Lamb's Book of Life? Well... The Bible tells us that if we accept the uh, provision that Jesus has made through his sacrifice, I should say the provision that God the Father made in giving his son, that when we accept that covenant and we ask God to forgive our sins and we repent of our sins, confess our sins, and that we with our hearts take up our cross and say, Lord, we want to follow you, 
if we're baptized, I believe then it's our names. It's a covenant we're making with God that our names are entered into the, to the book of life and um, that uh, we've just got that promise. Um, in, in Revelation, it also talks about the names being in the book of life in uh, one of the churches. He said, if if you don't repent, I'll take your name out of out the book, of, the of, book life. of life. Yes. So it must be in the book of life for church members. Right. Well, we have that verse, and I find it here in First John 1, verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So heartfelt confession, just coming to God, acknowledging our need of a Savior, confessing our sins, that gets a name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We want to make sure it stays in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's why Paul says, I die daily. It's a, a day by day surrendering of self to Christ. You know, we do have a book, Pastor Doug. It's called Three Steps to Heaven. And I think it'll cover these uh, very important questions. How do we get our name in the Lamb's Book of Life? How do we keep it in the Lamb's Book of Life? We'll be happy to send that book to anyone who calls and asks. The number is 800-835-6747. And you can ask for the book. It's called Three Steps to Heaven. Well, get in the mail. If you're outside of North America, you can read the book for free online at the Amazing Facts website. Next caller that we have is Damon, listening from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Damon, welcome to the program. Hey, how you guys doing? Good. Thanks for calling. Oh, thanks. Um, so I had a question about the virgin birth. I seen a debate online, and they were going back and forth whether it was the Holy Spirit or Joseph. And the people who were arguing Joseph used um, two two verses. And I was wanting to know what you guys thought about it. Um, they used Second Samuel seventeen twelve, and then First Chronicles seventeen eleven. All right. Well, let's read Second Samuel seventeen twelve. So we shall come upon him in some place where he shall be found, and we will light upon him as the dew falls upon the ground, and him, and all the men that are with him, and there shall not be left so much as one. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, no. It was Second Samuel seventeen twelve, I believe. You sure it wasn't First Samuel seventeen twelve? I just read Second Samuel oh seventeen twelve. I I apologize. I read sec Second Samuel seventeen two, seventeen twelve. Let me go here. You know that is seventeen twelve. Uh, I did. It may have been two. All right, let's try let's try First Samuel seventeen twelve and let's see if that hits the jackpot. So David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem Judea, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among them for an old man in the days of Saul. And then you're talking about the other verse where it says that uh, David was among uh, seven brothers? Uh, no, I must have got the verse wrong. I thought it was, uh, what about, let's try First Chronicles 17, 11, because I think that's another one. Yeah, I got the verse right here. Let me read that while you turn to that passage. It says, and it shall be, when your days are fulfilled, you must go to be with your fathers, and I will set up your seed after you, and will be of your sons, and I'll establish his kingdom. So I was probably talking about the lineage uh, of Christ. So you said people were arguing, they were using these verses, and they were arguing about the, the divinity of Joseph or whether it was through David? Well, no, the um, virgin birth. They were saying that the verses were saying that it was Joseph who was actually the one who got um, Mary impregnated, not the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, the Bible tells us, if you read in Luke, it traces the genealogy of Jesus through Mary's father. And so Mary was also a, a child, a descendant of David, as well as Joseph. But uh, l let me give you something to think about. Mm. The Bible tells us that the conception was of the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And so if the conception is of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't mean that God had some intimate relationship with Mary per se. You know that um, a man can have his seed taken from him and he can, <laughs> it can be transported and inseminate someone on the other side of the planet. It's called artificial insemination. And so I, I spoke to a rabbi once while he ac actually was a Jewish Christian and he said, yeah, I've read there in the New Testament where it says that Mary was conceived of the Holy Spirit, where Jesus is the son of Joseph. God took a seed from Joseph and filled it with the Holy Spirit and impregnated Mary with Joseph's seed. So what would have prevented God from doing that? I really didn't have a good answer for him because it could have happened that way. We know that Jesus, there's something supernatural about him. But um, so I think that that verse is a lot of latitude in there, but we just know that Mary was a virgin. The Bible's very clear about that. It was a virgin birth. 
-hmm. And you, he, the Bible even quotes in Matthew, behold, a virgin will conceive and bring forth a son. So there's no question about that. But if humans can artificially inseminate a person, why would we think that God can't? Uh, and I was thinking that also, like, how can, I don't know if this is a valid point, but um, how can Joseph, he's a man, you know, create Jesus, who's God, you know, a mortal man? Right. Well, and, and I don't think it happened that way. I think that Jesus, uh, there was something definitely supernatural about Christ. And his birth is one example of that. But he was 100 percent human. So the Bible refers to this as the mystery of godliness, how God became a man. The incarnation is a great mystery for us. I don't think science can explain it. And we're sort of we're, we're you know, tiptoeing around the unknown when we try to explain that. And, you know, if somebody's going to believe the Bible, there's, there's little doubt. If you're looking first at uh, Luke chapter one, verse thirty five, this is the angel speaking. He makes it very clear. He says the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The angel is talking to Mary and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Also, that Holy One who is born of you will be called the Son of God. So you can't really get about or get around that. This, this was directly the result of the Holy Spirit doing a miraculous work in Mary. So, hey, we thank you very much, Damon. Hope that helps a little bit talking about the incarnation. We've got Michaela listening in Massachusetts. Michaela, welcome to the program. Hi, Pastor. Thank you so much. My question is, should Christians invest in the stock market? Um, well, you know, there's no verse uh, per se on the stock market, but Jesus does share a parable where, and I forget where that is in Matthew, John, where uh, the ter parable of the talents, where Jesus said, uh, this is unfaithful servant, and he takes his master's money and he buries it, and master comes back, he gives it back to him, and the master said, you wicked and lazy servant, you should have at least invested it with the banker so I could have got my interest. Well, what bankers do is they invest in the stocks. And so Jesus said, you know, if you invest in companies that over time are shown to do better than a regular, you know, small investment of a bank, our mutual fund is basically getting a fund of stocks. There's nothing wrong with investing in companies. Now, uh, I personally uh, invest a little bit in the stock market. I don't day trade and I don't invest in tobacco companies. I, I don't invest in Disney or some, some of these entertainment companies that try and invest in things that a Christian can morally say, this is, sounds like a good company to do any good work and I'm going to invest in them. But um, mm -hmm. so I don't know if that helps you at all. I, I don't think we ought to be gambling where you're trying to day trade and speculate. But when you put your money in the bank, what do you think the bank does? They invest in the stocks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Next caller that we have is uh, Vanessa listening from Los Angeles. Vanessa, welcome to the program. Hi. Thank you for taking my question. So my question is regarding marriage. Okay. Uh, my boyfriend and I have been together for a long time, are committed to each other, but are of different Christian religious backgrounds. And I just want to know how we can go about a union before God so that we can be married, but, you know, respecting each other's religious views. Well, you know what Paul says? Uh, he, he says you should not be unequally yoked together. And there, there's a real problem if uh, people marry and they do not have, they're not united in their faith. Now, when you say you're of different religious persuasions, you mean different denominations of Christian or different religions? Yes, different Christian denominations. Do you mind my asking how big the difference is? <laughs> um, <laughs> pretty, I mean, like if, if one of you is a Methodist and one of you is a Baptist, you'll have problems, but it won't be as bad if one of you is a Jehovah Witness and one of you is a, a Latter-day Saint. So, <laughs> Well, I was raised Catholic and he was raised SDA, um, but... You know, I don't think you should get married until you are in agreement about your faith because okay. it really is a problem when, um, you know, just in the example that you just cited, uh, yeah. you know, if, if you probably, if you've been dating for a while, you know, there's some significant differences. Yes. And, and um, yeah, even like if you have kids and you say, oh, well, what day are we going to go to church? You go, you go on two different days. That'll wear them out. So, so yeah, you, you want to be of the same faith. You know, I think this is a great opportunity if two people are thinking about getting married, and of course that is a very important decision, uh, the least they could do is sit down and study out what the other person believes mm -hmm. and just have an open and frank Bible study. Look at the differences and ask which is closest to the Word of God. Sometimes we're going to go against 
maybe our family background or the tradition that uh, has been prominent in our household and, and seek to know God's will. After all, if you want God's blessing on your marriage, you want to make sure that you're following the Bible as close as possible. So there is an opportunity for that. And we encourage you to do that, Vanessa. Find a, some good lessons. Amazing Facts has some lessons that will actually help people go through the Bible and learn very important Bible principles. And that's for free at the Amazing Facts website. Yes, absolutely. Recommend that. And uh, go through a set of studies together and see if you guys can, um, you know, can two walk together unless they're agreed? And that's Jesus. And I think Jesus was quoting Hosea when he said that. But um, thank you, Vanessa. And do we have, no, we don't have time for another question. Oh, listening friends, we see you, George and Sylvia, Diana, Troy. We did not get to your question tonight. We hope you give us another chance. Friends, hope you'll go to the Amazing Facts website. You can study and listen all week long. Amazingfacts.org. God willing, we'll get together and study his word again together next week. This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. If you'd like answers to your Bible-related questions on the air, please call us next Sunday between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Pacific Time. To take advantage of the offers you've heard on this broadcast, call us at 800-835-6747 or visit our website at amazingfacts.org. Tune in next time for more Bible Answers Live. Honest and accurate answers to your Bible questions. An international pandemic killing thousands, riots ripping communities apart, a global economic implosion. Many are wondering, is this the end of the world? Few question the military, economic, and technological might of the United States. So if we really are facing the last days, if these worldwide catastrophes are really harbingers of the end, Shouldn't we expect the United States to play a key role in the final events of Bible prophecy? The book of Revelation provides unmistakable clues. And to help you understand them, Amazing Facts is releasing America in Bible Prophecy. It's going to take you step by step in identifying the global forces at work in these last days. You might be surprised what the Bible really says. You owe it to yourself to find out. So get yourself a copy of America in Bible Prophecy. For life-changing Christian resources, visit afbookstore.com or call 1-800-538-7275. I grew up mostly in New York City. I was sent to many different boarding schools. Most of these schools told me that there was no purpose in life. And I saw in my home, people were not very happy. And I would think about suicide. Sharing a personal testimony can be one of the most powerful ways to win souls to Christ. That's why I'd like to invite you to discover and share a new presentation of my Richest Caveman testimony. It's now available on a special DVD from Amazing Facts. We've even included the award-winning Kingdoms in Time documentary that recently aired on the History Channel. To get your copy of The Richest Caveman, visit afbookstore.com or call 800-500. 538-7275. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. We hope you understand your Bible even better than before. Bible Answers Live is produced by Amazing Facts International, a faith-based ministry located in Granite Bay, California.